the Irish state is being asked to explain its role in the Troubles. We certainly feel that the Irish government could have done a lot more to stop the campaign of genocide that was happening in Fermanagh, Tyrone, South Armagh and indeed in Londonderry as well. Unionists repeatedly return to this and try to claim that if it wasn't for the Irish government there wouldn't have been the IRA campaign. I think it is what about it. There's almost no memory whatever of collusion between the Irish state, passive or active, and the IRA. My party was totally, totally against the use of violence in achieving their political aims. Totally, 100%, 101%. Next time I'm in Dublin, um, I, I certainly will be talking about these matters. The issue of the Irish state's attitude and actions have also been thrown centre stage by a tribunal in Dublin investigating allegations that Gardaí colluded with the IRA. So will Ireland answer a unionist call to apologise for any part it had in the Troubles, as the question of how to deal with the past hangs over the future? Nowhere is the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic more physically marked than here at Narrowwater. The British Army suffered its biggest loss of life in the Troubles when two bombs were detonated here in the north from across the water in the south. Throughout the Troubles, questions were raised about the Irish state's role as Unionists complained the Republic provided a sanctuary for on-the-run terrorists. As the young seek to understand the conflict, and as politicians contest the past, the history of the Troubles can often appear an exercise in whataboutery. To the next generation, the question what about allegations of Irish state collusion with the IRA may come to appear no more than the obvious rejoinder to cries of what about British collusion with loyalists. But the truth about the past is not a game. It is a signpost to the future, and the evidence for and against Irish state collusion must be examined. It was as a result of political negotiations at Weston Park over a decade ago that a number of inquiries into alleged British and Irish collusion were set up. And in Dublin, one of those inquiries, led by Judge Peter Smithick, has been examining claims of Garda collusion in the IRA murder of two police officers. Chief Superintendent Harry Breen and Superintendent Bob Buchanan were travelling back across the border after a meeting with their Irish Garda counterparts in Dundalk on March 20th, 1989, when they were ambushed by a gang of IRA gunmen. They were the two most senior policemen murdered during the Troubles. I was meant to be in the car. It was both Harry and I who were going down that morning. Alan Mains was Harry Breen's staff officer, but his place on the trip to Dundalk was taken instead by Bob Buchanan. Officers Breen and Buchanan went to Dundalk to discuss a possible operation against Thomas Slab Murphy, who they identified as IRA chief in South Armagh. So the, the, the castle there, but I suppose when you... They, they were coming up this way, you know. Harry Breen had been worried about travelling there because he suspected some guards had links to the IRA. He had a lot of reservations about it, you know. I think it was more to do with the, the fact that it was Murphy and, and he did mention his concerns clearly to me at the time about the fact that people were on, you know, in, you know, in Harry's opinion, were on the payroll of Slab Murphy from the Guardi. Harry Breen also knew he was among the IRA's top targets after he appeared in the media following the SIS ambush at Loch Gall, in which eight IRA men had been killed. As you can see, the weapons are very high powered. And it is quite evident that not only did the terrorists intend to uh, destroy the station, but also to 
uh, kill any of the occupants in the station. The IRA double murder was a serious setback to the RUC. That was a significant blow with especially Harry. Uh, he would have had tremendous knowledge as a constable and cross McLean right through to being a chief superintendent in the division. I mean, he, there's, there's very, probably nothing that he didn't know in terms of personalities within the provisional IRA. But the question has always been, how did the IRA know the two policemen were on the road that day? And specifically, was there a leak from Dundalk Garda Station? Harry Breen's staff arranged the meeting in Dundalk by phone, only hours before it took place at 2 p.m. The Breen family solicitor, John McBurney, says the timing of the phone calls from Newry Police Station to Dundalk is significant. On the day itself, between 9 o'clock in the morning and perhaps 10.15, uh, several phone calls uh, occurred, uh, firming up the arrangements. Then, just over an hour after these calls, around 11.30, it is understood that British Army listening devices in South Armagh picked up a rush of IRA communications. Was this the start of the preparation for the IRA attack? And if it was, how did the IRA know to get ready when only a handful of people in Newry and Dundalk police stations say they knew about the meeting? The officer's car couldn't have been spotted before this, because they didn't leave Newry until after 1.30. The question the tribunal is obviously addressing very directly is whether or not the provisional IRA had information beyond 10 past 10, quarter past 10, that the men were coming. Expert witnesses to the tribunal have said that to spot the officer's car at 1.30 and mount the huge operation just after half past three would surely have been impossible. The IRA was either already covering the roads or was tipped off about the trip to Dundalk. Where in hell can you go? Far from Journalist Chris Ryder says Republican terrorists viewed the South as a hiding place from security forces in Northern Ireland. Dundalk at one stage was around Gundalk. Many people who left Northern Ireland to avoid justice went on the run and stayed on the run in the Republic of Ireland. And uh, they generally felt that it was a safe haven. It's a view shared by General Sir John Wilsey, a former head of the British Army in Northern Ireland. A successful terrorist organisation must have a safe border behind which to shelter. You must have a, a population or a community or an area or a base which is protected and safe. This man, known as Kevin Fulton, appeared before the tribunal and said he was a former British Army agent who infiltrated the IRA's South Down unit. The engineering and the bomb making would have been 99% based in the South. You had no RUC or covert army units running around. We made bombs and they went all over Northern Ireland. They would have went up as far as Derry, stroke London Derry, Belfast all north down, south down, they went everywhere. Kevin Fulton is significant because he's given key evidence to the Smithic Tribunal, claiming he was present when a Dundalk guard passed information to the IRA. That evidence was pivotal to the inquiry being set up into the murders of Breen and Buchanan. But it is also highly controversial, and the Tribunal has heard Kevin Fulton described as an intelligence nuisance and a compulsive liar likely to provide false information. The tribunal has, though, heard that Fulton also provided good intelligence on many occasions. But whether or not Smithick ultimately believes his story, what this inquiry has done is shine a light on the role of the Irish state and border security during the Troubles. Border security was a major point of contention between Britain and Ireland. The bombing at Narrowater in August 1979 brought it into sharp focus. 18 soldiers were killed outside Warren Point when the IRA detonated two bombs from across the border a short distance away. 
They were in the south, and so they were unmolested. They knew they were completely um, untouched. And we could do nothing about it. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher immediately flew to Northern Ireland and began to pressure the Irish for tougher security. And as part of the negotiations for the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985, better security cooperation led to increased staffing at Dundalk Garda Station. But recently leaked American government cables revealed that Thatcher felt Dublin was still dragging its feet on security by 1987, as she even offered funding to train Irish police and army in anti-terror tactics. An offer, then Justice Minister Jerry Collins says, was turned down. We didn't need the British to spend money. It was our responsibility as a sovereign state to fulfil our constitutional obligations, and that we did. We understand Judge Smithick has also been searching through both Thatcher and former Taoiseach Guard Fitzgerald's briefing papers for any government discussion of a Garda leak. By 1985, rumours about a Dundalk Garda mole were rife, and the tribunal has heard that an RUC special branch document from that year even named a particular guard. The INLA had a big uh, funeral here in Dundalk, the Rastlery murders. Uh, These the rumours became known in Dundalk itself, says it's Dan Prenty, who was a detective inspector in the town during the 80s. But no one investigated. It was going on for a long time. It, it, it really, it was... Not much notice was taken of it, uh, to be honest about it, but, but uh, it, it was never seen as serious enough for a major investigation, as far as I know, to be carried out into it. But suspicions became so widespread that a former Monaghan Chief Superintendent, Tom Curran, has told Smithick that in 1987, Bob Buchanan actually asked him to raise concern at Garda HQ. He said he went to then Assistant Commissioner Eugene Crowley and told him that the RUC was concerned a guard was associating with the IRA. But he claimed Crowley barely looked up from the files he was reading. As Curran told Smithick, in a very short time I got the opinion he didn't want to hear it, so I left. Curran informed Smithick that Bob Buchanan had said there was intelligence indicating Corrigan was associating with provisionals, but admitted there was no evidence to that effect. Owen Corrigan was unavailable for this programme, but here he is speaking previously to Spotlight. The South Armagh has been part of the Troubles, a unique part of the, the subversive activity on the border. In a statement before he died, Crowley disputed this version of events, saying he had never heard anything about Corrigan. But Owen Corrigan is the same guard Kevin Fulton told Smithick he witnessed passing information to the IRA. Owen Corrigan has strenuously denied all allegations against him. His solicitor points out that he has successfully sued over such allegations in the past. And his record has been defended by fellow officers. He has been commended for fighting terrorism, including handing over INLA man Dominic McGlinchey to the RUC. His solicitor has evidence to show he was on sick leave at the time Kevin Fulton says he was passing information to the IRA. Two further guards from Dundalk Station have come under suspicion too, though they also dispute the allegations. The Irish authorities appear to have done very little to investigate a leak. It was only after the Breen and Buchanan murders that they launched an internal investigation. But even before that began and just hours after the killings, the RUC and the guards dismissed all claims of a leak. I absolutely and positively reject any suggestion of that kind. I can say now that categorically, the evidence which we have firmly confirms to us that there was no mole. Can you indicate no, I cannot. Being specific, what that might amount to? No, I'm sorry, not at this time. But how could both men have been so sure there was no mole just hours after the murders? A former senior special branch officer and an ex-deputy chief constable have both told Spotlight in their experience they could not have made this call so soon. I think that to, they had to do that for reassurance reasons. Um, Sir John Herman would have been mindful of the fact that uh, he could have triggered off a response to retaliation by loyalist elements or indeed uh, created a situation where the RUC record failed would have refused to cooperate with the Garda. 
The then Justice Minister Jerry Collins and Garda Commissioner Eugene Crowley met, and Crowley sent a senior guard to investigate in Dundalk. Before he had even reached Dundalk Garda Station, Eugene Crowley had given a statement to say there's no mole in Dundalk Garda Station. How could, how could I, Eugene I, Crowley I, do I, that? I can't, I can't answer that. I can't answer that. If Commissioner Eugene Crowley said that, that was the belief that he had in time. Would you think it a bit strange to uh, make a statement before you had the facts to hand and the report to hand? I, I, again, I, I, can't, I can't answer that. That was a, an internal police decision. Smithick has heard evidence that suggests the Garda investigation was limited in scope. Many officers on the morning shift on the day of the murders were not even questioned. None of those officers were, were searched down and interviewed. And uh, that, to me, uh, would have been one of the most important lines of inquiry. Extraordinarily, the tribunal also heard evidence that the officers who carried out the investigation were never ordered to investigate a leak, but instead were merely told to establish officers' movements at Dundalk Garda Station on the day of the murders. So how then could the final report to Eugene Crowley one month later confidently state in its conclusion, there is no leak in Dundalk Garda Station. For some, it suggests that the inquiry was window dressing, which allowed Gardaí to say they had investigated. But any suggestion of the state avoiding the issue of the leak is hotly contested. Do you think there would be any reluctance in the Irish state to fully investigate the issue because of the potential none political ramifications? None whatsoever. No, none whatsoever. The, the, the sort of innuendo in that question is that such might have existed. It did not exist. The government's bona fides of this are, are beyond question. But in January 1990, a special Garda task force planned to raid the home of IRA quartermaster Michael McEvitt, looking for a false passport. At 11 o'clock the night before the raid, Dundalk guards were told of the operation. And ex-guard Dan Prenti has told Smithick that shortly after that, a phone call was made to warn McEvitt. So is this definitive evidence that someone in the Dundalk Guards was tipping off the IRA less than a year after the Breen and Buchanan murders? McEvitt has denied receiving such a call, but Smithick has heard his phone was tapped. So the question is, is there a tape of the alleged tip-off and where is it? Smithick has also located Garda intelligence containing claims that the IRA had friends in Dundalk's police station. And yet it seems there was still no action taken. It's entered into the Irish psyche that some guards were prepared to be a little flexible with the law, as seen here when Sergeant Boyle colludes with an IRA man in the movie The Guard. What? I mean, an AK-47 at lock and a derringer. That's a lot to go missing, like. Well, have you any idea what happened to them? Maybe the mice ate them. Huh? Maybe the mice ate them. I can't be after putting that in my report. Maybe the mice ate them. No? Not really, no. Why don't you put in your report that Sergeant Boyle went out of his way to do you boys a favour? The satirical film taps into the belief that there were some rotten apples in the guards. But is there any truth in it? Sean O'Callaghan is a former IRA commander and police informer who was invited to give evidence to Smithick but declined. He claims the guards were not as tough on the IRA as they could have been. I remember one occasion being arrested and this Garda detective who had just known me for years, there was a young Garda detective, literally new, and he walks in and he says to this Garda detective, now he says, you sit there, Sean's going to sit there, you ask Sean some questions and Sean will educate you. And he walked off laughing. But any idea of a soft approach is strongly rejected by ex-Dundalk detective Dan Prenti. Were you, as a guard, ever directed to go easy on the IRA? Never. No, that was never a policy at all. Never. So. The guards, at all times, uh, always and every, uh, at every chance, confronted the IRA. But Sean O'Callaghan alleges some guards were sympathetic to the IRA and he was aware of a senior IRA man, now a politician, who was handling a Garda contact in the mid-80s. That Garda contact was paid £5,000, uh, which I knew for the IRA was a, 
a huge amount of money for the IRA to pay in those circumstances. I was the OC of the IRA Southern Command, but I wasn't handling this, or I wasn't being allowed to handle this. This was being handled as sort of a pay grade above me, if you like. But it wasn't just the guards who were an issue for the British government. General Wilsey, who had seven tours on duty in Northern Ireland, says he was frustrated that he never once was able to speak one-to-one -one with his Irish army counterparts. They were not to talk uh, or have any dealings with the British army, which, was, which, as far as Dublin was concerned, was an alien army, an occupying army, and Dublin didn't want to have any dealings with us. What difference would cooperation with the Irish Army in the south have made? It would have made a tremendous difference. It could have brought the troubles to a halt, I would have thought. It's 20 past three in the afternoon. Kevin Myers was a Dublin journalist working in Belfast during the Troubles, who later wrote an article which made allegations of guarded collusion that played a part in the creation of the Smithic Tribunal. The Finnafor government ministers actively encouraged the formation of the provisional IRA actively fed money, government money, to the IRA. They helped to arm the IRA. They gave moral support to the IRA. They were sympathetic to the cause of United Ireland. That was official Irish policy. Now, uh, the Irish state, of course, couldn't engage in a war with Britain to do that. And so there were elements there who said, right, let the IRA do the dirty work. That there were... But the former Fianna Fáil Justice Minister finds this view offensive. My party was totally, totally against the use of violence in achieving their political aims. Totally, 100%, 101%. Brian Feeney argues the plot by some Irish government ministers to arm the IRA in the 70s did not have the backing of the state. That was not the Irish government. Um, that, there were a couple of individuals, and there's absolutely no doubt there were individuals, particularly in Fianna Fáil, who did want to send guns to the north. And the Irish government actually stamped on the plot and threw out the people who were involved and put them, in, put them on trial. He also says that unionist claims the Irish state turned a blind eye or allowed the IRA to do its dirty work are laughable. This is a, a, a fairly familiar unionist myth. The Irish state was very worried about the role of the IRA and the prospect at certain times of the IRA destabilising the Irish state. Historically, it was extradition which was the major source of contention between the British and Irish, a point which then Taoiseach Jack Lynch felt the heat over following Narrowwater. One of the, 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 the most shameful episodes, one of the most shameful aspects of this is the failure of the government to extradite known IRA terrorists to uh, the north, and any sort of excuse was found not to do this. Until the mid-80s, Irish law meant IRA members could escape extradition to the north to face terrorist charges by claiming a political motivation. The extradition laws were difficult. For example, in the 1980s, it's 30 years ago now, they wouldn't extradite people who had escaped from jail in the north because people who had escaped uh, from prison in the big escape were badly beaten by British soldiers and prison warders when they were brought back again. So they weren't extradited because of the danger of injury. Many cases like that of Republican Evelyn Glenn Holmes ended not in extradition, but in farce. The court ruled that there were faults in the new warrants and again ordered Glenn Holmes to be released. Figures reveal that of 113 extradition requests for terrorist-related offences made to the Republic between 1973 and 1997, only eight were granted. Dan Prenti says this was not the fault of the guards, but it was the fault of the courts and the state. I personally dealt with all the extradition warrants that came to Dundalk and uh, every one of them that came to Dundalk were, were executed and the culprits uh, or the person's name uh, taken before the district court. I felt bad about the fact that I had executed the warrants, taken them to the court and then no progress to report. But Jerry Collins seems reluctant to get into this thorny issue. Were we any different from any other country at the time? I know the French you couldn't extradite a fly out of, out of France. But I can't say I don't. Leave that question for someone else, OK? <laughs> the 
the Dublin government is now awaiting Smithick's findings. The hearings will run until at least Easter and a final report is expected later this year. With the clock ticking, the Breen family solicitor says the tribunal may set up a video link in Northern Ireland to encourage witnesses who have yet to come forward. Of those of whom I know, there would be four Ministry of Defence witnesses, which would include, for example, a, a soldier who was present on the ground at the relevant periods of time. Getting to the truth, though, is a long and difficult process. The Secretary of State is currently holding talks with the Stormont political parties in an effort to find a process to deal with the legacy of the Troubles. In recent months, like the Irish government, he too has been made fully aware that the past remains a toxic issue. I was so angry with the Prime Minister that I actually called a halt to the meeting. Just days after David Cameron told the family of Pat Finucane they would not get a full public inquiry, Tisha Gendy Kenny met the Finucans and promised to raise their case in London, Europe and Washington. But the DUP's Geoffrey Donaldson says if the British government are going to deal with the past to create a better future, Enda Kenny also has to address the allegations of Irish collusion with the IRA. The response from the Irish government has been uh, a non-cooperation in terms of meeting to discuss these issues. Enda Kenny and his government can't have it both ways. Uh, he can't travel around the world saying, I want to know the truth. Um, and I want to see a public inquiry in the Finucan case and at the same time deny hundreds of innocent victims the right to question the Irish government on their role. And Ulster Unionist Danny Kennedy says he's tried for nearly nine months to get a full meeting with the Taoiseach, but only managed to have a brief discussion at a North-South Ministerial Council meeting in Armagh. I presented uh, Enda Kenny with, with a dossier detailing the murders of 159 uh, members either of the security forces or individuals uh, uh, at the hands of, uh, of, a, uh, of South Armagh Republicans who had operated from his jurisdiction. And they have to stand up and say it was wrong and they have to stand up and say we apologise. Spotlight has also asked the Taoiseach, the Taunestown Foreign Minister and the Justice Minister to talk about these issues. But no one at Leinster House was available for interview. It was the same response from the Garda. For some, chasing down either government is a game of sectarian whataboutery. I think on, on both cases you've got a political agenda going on there. Um, when Republicans seek uh, apologies from the British government, what they are out to try to show is that it was all the British government's fault. And on the Unionist side, that it was some outside force which destabilised Northern Ireland, which was a great wee place before 1969. But for Geoffrey Donaldson and other Unionists, this is not whataboutery, but a demand for parity for Unionist concerns. And he's adamant that there can be no agreed mechanism for dealing with the past until this issue is addressed. There will be no process that the DUP will sign up to or agree to that does not have the Irish government made fully accountable. Uh, they want to be involved in the future. Uh, well, they've got to do, uh, give account for the past. But accountability for the future that we offer the young demands that we find a way to come to terms with the past. The attitudes of all parties to the outcome of the Smithic Tribunal can help or hinder this process. If there is to be agreement on the way forward, ultimately there will have to be greater agreement on where we have come from. It is not a matter of whataboutery, but of finding a basis of truth on which to build.